So hello everyone and welcome back to the judicial process. Uh, today's topic, we're looking at the law of American courts. Specifically, we're emphasizing criminal law and that's a theme you'll see throughout this um, course and, and throughout the book and throughout the lectures uh, is a tendency towards criminal law. If you're interested in civil law, um, definitely think about a legal studies major here at Elmira College. Um, one of the classes that you'll take is a survey class that dives into civil law, like torts and things like that, and then lawsuits. Um, then you'll take a legal research and writing class where you will dive way into a lawsuit um, and you'll get those kind of like firsthand experiences. So with that being said, um, again, this is gonna be more tailored to criminal law. But we're gonna look at the law of American courts today uh, and recognize that it's separate than jurisdiction, which we'll talk about in the next video. So when we think about law, we have to think of the philosophical basis of law, right? So law didn't just happen, nor did it. So a couple of things that we have to know, a couple of key terms um, when we're thinking about the law is we have to understand what the state of nature is, right? The state of nature, when we're talking about it in a legal sense or a philosophical sense, refers to true anarchy. Now, I know it's kind of coming into your head right now. You're thinking of like the purge and just like all things that come with anarchy and anti-government and just all that. Um, that's not the case, right? It literally just means that there's no laws. There's no government. People just are living on this planet and there's no laws, right? That's the state of nature. Um, we just live. Now, that being said, uh, absolute freedom, um, again, is, is kind of what we see in the state of nature. Absent, absent positive law. So positive law refers to any law that's made by basically man. Um, basically, it, 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 it's statutes, it's criminal codes, it's case law, what have you. That's positive law, right? Like you positively created something, you made it. Now, there's two conflicting theories as to what this state of nature, this absence of positive law would look like. So John Locke was a societal theorist. And um, he believed that the state of nature was actually a state of peace. So if we didn't have government, we didn't have law, we would all figure out a way to get along. That would be kind of our natural inclination, right? Because uh, you would see somebody, you know, like, oh, that person looks like me, or I recognize that as a human being, they're not a threat. And um, it's one. That, that John Locke suggests there be immense cooperation um, and, and justice would be an interesting way to, to, to be served is because you would kind of develop these kind of natural relationships and natural social boundaries, um, which you can kind of see as the predicate to written down laws. Um, now, again, John Locke is all about the state of nature, right? He's like, it, it's one of peace. If we get rid of the government, we get rid of the law. Uh, we have a state of peace. Now, he didn't want to get rid of the government and the law because he goes off on a tangent about property law for a very long time. He's like really super concerned about property. Um, and he's like, we need the government to protect property. And it doesn't really match the rest of his theory, but it is what it is. Now, on the opposite side, thinking about natural law, we have John Rawls, right? Rawls was a, is a chaos theorist, right? So, Rawls said, if we lived in the state of nature, if there was no law, so there's no courts or anything along those lines, there's no law, life would be, and this is a direct, very famous quote, nasty, brutish, and short. All right, so he believed that the state of nature is really a state of war, right, where you are going to try to gain the most from any situation for yourself and, and, um, and doing so kind of create a positive sum game 
um, where your um, you kind of your your zero sum game where your your win is their loss and vice versa. So um, the idea is you would be naturally you set up somewhere right little piece of land and you would naturally defend it from anybody who came around. Um, and if you were going to a market or something like that, um, you know you would expect there would be people to there to hurt you to take your money. Um, it would just be absolute chaos, and and it would create like long-standing feuds um so long-standing meaning even longer than the hatfields and the mccoys if you don't know that reference look it up um, it's a really interesting feud between a bunch of hillbillies now um Rawls basically said how we would do deal with justice um is let's say you come on and, and you kill my brother right and same nature there's a you, there's kind of a debt and there there's a, a a feud there. Now I have to kill you, right? And somebody from your family might see that as well. We have to get back at them, and they're going to kill me. And one of my family members is going to kill them. And it kind of just goes back and forth, where it's just this nasty, just horrible system that isn't really a system. It's just taking justice into your own hands. And do we really want people who are angry, who've been aggrieved, who are hurt, who aren't thinking rationally, who, who aren't thinking logically, to be this person who decides what justice really is? Right? So we have a very conflicting um, set of theorists here. All right, so um, that being said, they both embrace the tradition of uh, positive law. So when we think about it in those terms, uh, the true state of nature is unknowable, right? We weren't there, there weren't records kept, we don't know, right? Um, and we know there's an evolutionary aspect and, and things along those lines. Now, um, that being said, both sides, like I said, uh, the chaos theorists and the societal theorists, both concede that it is in the best interest of mankind to form a positive law system, right? Including a fully functional judicial system. And the idea is the judicial system essentially takes the law, interprets the law, and applies the law, right? So whether you're very far, and you can kind of think of these terms like really early terms, very far left or very far right, uh, there's pretty much universal agreement that we need a legal system. We need a judicial system uh, where cooler heads prevail, where there's written down rules, so we're not in a state of a nasty, brutish, and short life, or um, we're not worried about our personal property. Okay. So that brings us to positive law. Right, so positive law has developed over time and also geographically. Um, now, as it's developed, um, it's formed a set of these kind of ever evolving uh, legal systems, also called families of law. Now, there, before we were all so interconnected. Um, you basically had regions where you just practiced law, uh, a, a, some kind of tradition of law. You had some kind of judicial system. You had some kind of legal system um, that was formed based upon the little region that you lived in, right? Like everybody there was of the same religion or everybody there was the same ethnicity race and, and they interpreted holy Bibles and or the Quran in different ways. And um, that's what worked for that region. Right now, as time passes and we start to become more interconnected, suddenly we see um, these traditions merge. Right. So, and again, it happens very much regionally, um, but it kind of is on an expanding basis as people see, oh, that's a better system. Um, and again, as we have wars, as, as we have like everything from cultural appropriation, you name it. Um, we see the spread of very um, specific legal families, so very specific legal traditions. 
Now, to kind of give you an idea of how quickly we are all embracing a traditional, um, or we're all embracing kind of one system, we're getting to that point, right? That's kind of like not the goal of humanity, but that's kind of where we're headed, is trying to get to one system, or at least two. Um, so in 1926, right, there were only 16 legal families, right? 1926, there were 16 families involved. Before that, there were a lot more. But we just say 1928 was the, the, the place where, say, 16 legal families, families of the law, so 16 different types of traditions and practice. As of today, there are really only four unique systems of law, right? So we've gone from 16 to four in 100 years. So, um, well, a little less than 100. Um, we're kind of rapidly merging and, and, and moving forward. Now, um, the four systems that we see today, the main systems, right? Uh, we have the common law, which is the American system. Um, it's based upon um, precedent and court cases and all that jazz, right? So we have statutes, but that we have courts that interpret the statutes and give them meaning uh, and fill in the blanks uh, and apply them. That's a common law, right? And, and as you can see from the map, United States, Canada, Australia, um, India, parts of Africa, uh, they all have um, common law systems there in the red. Then we have civil law systems. Civil law systems, it's super easy to be a lawyer in because all you have, because everything's written down, like everything is written down in a book. So um, the legislature, when they're passing laws, they, they try to think of every possible circumstance, every possible issue that could arise, and they put it in the law. So if you're a lawyer, all you have to do is find the right book, because they're publishing books and law, massive libraries, because um, they contain like every little caveat you can imagine, and you just read what the law is, and then you apply the law, right? So if, uh, if you're a lawyer, that's what you do. If you're a judge, that's what you do. Um, you can try to make some arguments that, well, it shouldn't really apply in this case, or this is different somehow. But for the most part, you're not gonna be able to because literally everything is written down. And we're not just talking criminal code, we're talking civil code. Uh, they will define in civil law what a contract is. The law defines what a contract is. In the common law system, court cases have defined what a contract is. Right, so if you wanna know what a contract is, you, in the civil law system, you just go to the book and read contract, what it is. And then it'll have all the related defenses and what happens if there's a breach and what, what are the, the penalties and all that jazz. Um, so those are kind of the two biggies. And as you can see, if we look at the map um, in terms of sheer population and sheer um, demographics, um, most systems in the United States or in the world um, are civil law systems, right? Where things are written down and, and um, it, it's a kind of an interesting caveat. Um, so we see civil law kind of expanding uh, more and more. Um, and again, you can kind of see where the civil law systems are. Uh, you'll see, I mean, basically all of Europe with the exception of England, uh, Northern Ireland, um, our civil law systems. Uh, one famous one that I get into in my comparative class is France. Um, France is a civil law system. There's all kinds of, like you're not given rights <laughs> in court. Um, you're expected to help in your own case and, and to tell the truth and testify. Uh, the judge asks you questions, not lawyers. It's really, it's a, it's a really interesting system. And we see that, right? And we see kind of at first the, the communist scare, right? Um, but then we look and we say, well, Europe, most of South America, arguably most of uh, Africa, most of Asia are civil law systems. Now, then we have the Islamic slash religious legal traditions. Um, so this is what you may have heard of before as Sharia law. 
right? Uh, it's a term that's used to scare the hell out of people um, who don't understand it, right? Uh, and basically, Sharia law is, is, is a legal system that's been set out um, in the Quran and interpretations of the Quran. And we always get like the really extremes. Like, so um, for instance, under if you followed the Islamic tradition exactly, right? In order to prove rape, a rape occurred, you as the victim would have to produce at least two eyewitnesses who were not parties to the rape who will testify that they had saw the exact same thing, right? And if they're a party and they change their mind, so like if it's a, it's a gang rape situation, a person changes their mind, they can't be called as a witness. So we see that and we get like the real scared and like the stoning to death and things like that. Now, those are some pretty extreme interpretations. Um, other interpretations have Islamic and religious legal traditions. Uh, they're very... Um, restorative centered, right? So the idea is how do we fix the victim and how do we make sure the offender doesn't commit this crime again? Now, arguably under, um, again, kind of more liberal interpretations of Sharia law, um, if you are convicted of murder, right? So it's the most serious offense, you're convicted of murder. Under Sharia law, you, if you're a male, you don't get the death penalty, right? And it depends on like who you kill. Um, but let's say you kill the provider. So there's a family of four that lives next door to you. And only the male works, only the male provides for the family. Um, you guys get into an altercation over a fence, you kill them. Under the Sharia law, you have to have a job once you've been convicted. And you have to give every single penny of your paycheck to that family, right? The idea is to replace more or less and allow them to live their lifestyle um, that they would have if you hadn't killed their, the, the male figure in the house, the, the breadwinner. Um, now this leaves people very poor, <laughs> very angry. Uh, but also it teaches them a lesson. Uh, so a lot of times people have to pick up second jobs, third jobs, and, and there, there are some like cutoffs in terms of you, you, you get enough to live, but hey, you committed murder. Um, like your life shouldn't be easy. Um, yeah, take your entire paycheck and give it to the other family. Uh, now it's, there's caveats to that too. It's called blood money. Um, there, there's kind of a, in the Islamic tradition, um, if the victim forgives you, generally speaking, you're absolved of all punishment, right? Um, because the idea of forgiveness is a really big thing um, for people of this faith. Uh, and the idea is it's the highest thing that somebody can do, right? The, the greatest thing or the most godly thing that you can do is forgive somebody. Um, which is not an easy feat, right? So you're in a, kind of an Islamic court. So you're before like the elders of, of, of um, the Islamic legal tradition and you can decide to forgive the other person. And in doing so, you waive the blood money, you waive the, the restitution, um, but you're also honored as a very um, good person. Right, because it took uh, very a, a lot to forgive somebody who's who's killed a relative. Right, I, mean, I couldn't even imagine. Um, so there is a lot of emphasis on forgiveness, a lot of emphasis on restorative justice. Now we do get the extreme interpretations, right? So some countries go very extreme, and you know they stone women to death who've been sexually assaulted um, because they were married. Uh, you know things along those lines, like those are becoming less and less, and, and they're more radical headlines than what the Islamic law really is. Um, it's actually a, a very peaceful uh, law, legal tradition. And it is represented on this map in the yellow. 
Then we have the East Asian hybrid traditions, right? So um, you'll see that East Asian is, is, is for the most part um, blue. Uh, you, you do have uh, some customary law, uh, which is just uh, basically these, these, are, these are mixed traditions. So it's hard to give just one color to them. Um, but East Asian hybrid traditions, they take customary law. So how did people interact with each other before there was official government law? Um, what were the standards? What were the norms? They take that, they roll that into some civil statutes um, and, and try to codify it. But there's also customary law that kind of comes into place. So you kind of, you ping pong balance it back and forth. Um, so again, the, the East Asian traditions, generally speaking, uh, follow the customs and of, of, of the area, right? So uh, if you are expected to behave in a certain manner, then that's what the law will be. Um, if you are supposed to enter, engage in some kind of show of respect for an elder and you don't, um, under kind of their customs, like, and especially when we had small villages, like under the customs, you know, the elders were seen as the wisest and put in charge and disrespect was a huge thing. Um, so we see kind of East Asian traditions really trying to struggle between here are the customs, right? And here's what a fair legal system is. Um, there's problems on, on, on both sides. I mean, there's problems for each system, don't get me wrong. Um, but that's kind of where East Asia is, right? And, and so you kind of get a little bit of that in the green and there's definitely a mix. Now, there's one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about and it, it was just this notion that there's no one pure family of law, right? So um, let's take the United States, for example, and don't worry, I'll talk about Louisiana in a minute. Um, so the United States, right, we have common law where it's law that's been derived from cases. But we also have statutes. So we don't really have, we're not a civil law country, we're not a pure common law country, we're all mixed. And that's true for virtually every legal system is, is, is it's mixed, right? It's just different influences on the world. Now, United States, each state is common law, except for the state of Louisiana. This was a class that we were in person, I'd have you guess why, but I'll just say it. We bought Louisiana and the Louisiana Purchase from France. France follows a civil law system, right? So the law that was kind of in place in that time in that era uh, was civil law. So now we have a civil law system that meets a common law system and then things kind of get a little complicated and a little bit hairy. If you're interested in law school and you want to practice in Louisiana, I suggest going to a law school in Louisiana because they are the most capable of discussing the relationship between common law and civil law in the state. Um, and you don't see that outside of the state, right? It's this, this common law mentality. So just not that, I mean, even the United States, like we have one state that just kind of does its own thing. Um, but they're very important because they determine what laws we'll have and how laws are adjudicated. So we're gonna focus on the common law tradition. So uh, many of the former British colonies, right? So in now the United States uh, abide by the common law system and it traces its roots to English common law, right? And it, it makes sense. Um, even if we're thinking about starting a revolution and we say, okay, we want to we want to uh, be free, but we gotta have we have to have a justice system. We have to have this. We have to have this. It's probably just easiest to do with what you know. Um, why why try to rebuild the wheel? Like if it's already there and it's working, take it. And that's basically what the United States did. It just adopted it. Um, and you have to keep in mind that in the colonies. Um, everyone kind of identified themselves more or less as British. Um, that's why when you hear about the midnight ride of Paul Revere, um, who actually only got two miles, there's actually a woman um, who got much further, did a lot more good, uh, but her name didn't fit into the rhyme. So it was Paul Revere who, like he got captured after two miles, like, come on. Um, but 
they did not, contrary to popular belief, scream, the British are coming, the British are coming. Everyone was British. That wouldn't make any damn sense. Um, I mean, that, that would be like you walking down the street, um, you know, right, right out, outside of campus screaming, the Americans are coming, the Americans are coming. Like, yeah, we, that doesn't tell me anything. Instead, they actually, on their ride, screamed, the regulars are coming, right? And regulars was a reference to British soldiers, redcoats. Um, so they would scream, the regulars are coming, the regulars are coming. And that actually meant something. Um, so again, we have identified, our, identified ourselves as British in the colonies, and we set up our courts in such a way that they really were impacted by English common law. We just adopted English common law. We kind of adopted their system. Um, because that's what was imposed upon the colonies. And then we, we decided to break free. Um, again, why reshape, why reinvent the wheel? If, it, if it's working, great. And it's, if it's following the, the, the constitution and, and it's in line with what you decide that your country should be, then why not? Why not keep it, right? So when we think about common law, um, common law actually first appears in uh, 1066 uh, during the Norman Conquest in which King William I uh, consolidated power and gradually introduced centralized authority, right? So this is kind of, again, we're talking England. Um, it was kind of all spread out. Like it, it was a feudal system, right? So you had lords and you had serfs and the lords would have different laws for their little village that they make and they'd have like different courts, they'd be the adjudicators and the people of that village had to follow those laws. But if the people of that village went to another village, they had to follow the laws of that um, feudal Lord. And it was just, there was no harmony in the laws or the tradition, right? Of, of how do we adjudicate this? It was, it was very much a um, Lord by Lord, property owner by property owner situation. So what Norman, uh, which what King William I does is he says, okay, this, this is weird. Um, I'm going to introduce what's called the royal courts. And what the royal courts are going to do is they're going to settle disputes. Okay. Um, and, and that, again, this is kind of, this gets evolved. Um, it kind of evolves into this, this royal court. Um, and the royal court was a centralized court, right? The government would do it, not the Lord, not each Lord, not, no, no. The government would have royal courts where you could go settle disputes. Uh, now what it did is it did kind of supplement this and applied customs codified in the constitutions of Clarendon in 1164. And what happens from this kind of centralized authority is we get the name common law because it applied commonly to everyone in the land, right? So instead of village by village, this is what the law is here, this is what the, how we resolve disputes here, it was, okay, this is the law. Now there is some room for custom and, and your traditions, but this is the law and it applies to everyone commonly, whether you're a lord, whether you're a serf, it applies to everyone commonly in the land. And so that's where we get the term common law from. Now, the common law tradition, um, if you kind of recognize this over here, this, this picture here, uh, you, see them, you see this picture behind lawyers and those cheesy commercials all the time. Um, these are reporters. So we'll get to why these are important, but basically in this 18th century, the common law in both England and the United States was unwritten. Um, so if we look at like modern day, we, we see there are statutes, right? There, if we want to know what, we want to know what a murder is, we look at the state law of New York and we look at the criminal code and we look and see what the elements of murder are. Um, so it was largely unwritten though. So you just kind of had to know. Um, and that's the thing is common law, it was really an oral tradition handed down from generation to generation. Um, from lawyers and judges to lawyers and judges. And that's why you'd have like families of all lawyers because they would just kind of get passed down. 
Now they still had the doctrine of sorry decisis, which um, is Latin for let the decision stand. So what basically would happen is even though it wasn't written down um, in a like statute, uh, judges would write down their reasons for ruling a certain way uh, or interpreting the law a certain way. And it was your job to know the cases. Like, it was your job to know every single case that basically was handed down and to understand the, how the judges decided and why they decided, et cetera, right? So you'd let the decision stand, but you had to know what the decision was. Now courts would follow and still do follow precedent, right? So what previous courts have done, unless there's a really good reason to deviate. And if there's a good reason to deviate, there has to be an accompanying explanation as to why. Now, this hasn't changed too much, except we now have statutes, right? And the courts interpret statutes and fill in the blanks and things like that. Um, but today, you still need to know your cases, but it's a lot easier with the internet. Um, most appellate and Supreme Court cases are codified in case reporters. And so that's the picture that you see on the left hand of your screen. Um, this is the Supreme Court reporter. So um, it basically, we're, we're going to look at the citation here in a minute, um, but it just contains cases. Um, and they're usually contained in um, chronological order, right? So this might be cases, there's 122, 122A, 122B. This might be, and this is just the Supreme Court, this might just be the Supreme Court cases from a year, right? So think about how long we're talking in terms of the, the books that have been published. Um, if you've ever been in my office, uh, I have uh, the Massachusetts Reporter Series, the beginning of it, um, from the year after the Civil War ended. Um, it goes back a very long way. Um, so that's why we see giant law libraries, because that's where they're reported. Now, you don't have to know this for this course. Um, if you do take criminal law and criminal law too, you'll get to understand what legal citation is and what it means. But you know, when you see cases that come up in the book or you see cases that come up in other classes, um, you're going to see things like this, right? So the top one is Gideon versus Wainwright. And then it has a bunch of numbers and letters and a year. Right. Um, each of these letters and numbers, it's a code, basically, to tell us what book in a massive law library do I need to find in order to find this case and read this case. Right. So I know it's Gideon versus Wainwright. That doesn't really help me much. So then I look at the volume, reporter, and page number. So that's what the uh, 372 US 335. So there's different reporters for different, so the Supreme Court has its own reporter, it has the US reports, which are the official ones, it has the Supreme Court reporter, which are the basically official unofficial ones. Um, there are state reporters, there are regional reporters. So there's like the Northeastern, the Southeastern, like the, they have all kinds of different reporters, right? And so if you're in a law library and it has every law book in it, you need to start with your reporter and say, okay, I know it's in this, reporter, it's in the U.S. reports, it's a Supreme Court case. Um, and then you look at the citation and go, okay, I need to find, so I need, I know I need to look at the U.S. reports and I need, I need to find book number 372, right? That's just, just volume 372. And then when you get the book, it's just going to be a book of random cases. So that's where the next part of the citation, the 335 comes into play, because the 335 tells you on which page the case that you're reading begins. And then it ends with the year the case was decided. If it's not the Supreme Court, it will also include the lower court's name that decided the case. And you'll see that there's um, oftentimes multiple citations, right? So Gideon versus Wainwright is also in the Supreme Court reporter at 83, um, volume 83 on page 729. And you'll see it's still 1963 case. Um, that's where we kind of see some differences coming into play is if you need to look up cases, if you need to know your cases, you have to understand citation. Now, again, I don't expect you to know this. I don't expect that you're not gonna be tested on it, but just so you understand moving forward, when you see these letters and numbers, they actually have a meaning. Um, 
and they're just a code to help us find them in a giant law library. Now that everything's become digitized, it's a little bit different, um, but that's just kind of again where we're at. So that being said, uh, despite the codification of reporters, case law, also called common law, uh, it was often inconsistent, right? So you had different judges deciding different things. And so by the late 1800s, statutes, specifically we think about like at the federal level, which is the United States Code, um, enacted by Congress became the primary law. So instead of just relying on random decisions, we said, okay, the statutes of Congress or the statutes of a legislature will be primary law. Right? That's the, the, the law that prevails. And the idea was to kind of get everybody centralized, right? Uh, and it was responsible for uh, the law, the US code is responsible for managing the economy, social regulations, criminal regulations, and overriding inconsistent case law. Now, that being said, despite the fact that case law became secondary to statutes, um, case law still carries the full weight of law. So it is given the same treatment, it is given the same treatment as a um, statute is in terms of the binding effect and what it, it it means in, in terms of what the law is. Um, it's a necessary component of the legal system. And when we think about it this way, statutes or legislatures write statutes very broadly, very, very broadly, right? And it's up to the courts to fill in the gaps. Now, um, in, in, in your text, if you turn to page nine, um, there's box 1.12. And what it is, is an example of, okay, the legislature puts out a, it writes, it writes a statute, right? In this case, it deals with dog bites, okay? So it's um, the Animal Control Act, uh, 2006 update, which says, if a dog or other animal without provocation attacks, attempts to attack, or injures any person who is peacefully conducting him or herself in a place where he or she may lawfully be, the owner, and I stress owner, of such dog or other animal is liable in civil damages for such person for the full amount of the injury proximately caused thereby. So basically, if you own a dog and like the dog just attacks you for no reason, then the owner has to pay you. That's what I get from it. That's an oversimplification. Right? And there's so many words in there that we would bicker about. And that's what being a lawyer really is, is bickering about the definition of a word. Um, so what you have below it is actually a piece that I wrote in law school um, interpreting what this meant, uh, what the word owner meant. And there was case law that suggested it meant anybody who controlled the dog. So it doesn't necessarily mean the actual owner of the dog, but it, if you, you know, put some water down for the dog, and it's your friend's dog, you just put some water down because he asks you to. In that moment, you have control over the dog, the dog is yours. Um, so again, that's what the court said. That's probably not what this legislature meant. The legislature probably meant exactly what I said earlier. Um, but we, as lawyers, we quibble over words, right? And the idea is we don't want to be held liable. Like if I have a client whose dog bites somebody, I'm going to try to argue every single word that I can and say, it doesn't apply in this case, or, well, you can't call him the owner. Um, he wasn't the owner at the time because somebody else was taking care of him. Um, things along those lines. So, you know, it, our, our case law comes from conflict and really is defines um, the statute. Statutes are very broad, very general, and they don't incorporate the day-to-day -day, and they don't think about the day-to-day. -day. That's the court's job. Right? And that's where we're going to look at the judicial process coming in as interpreting the, the law and applying it in such a way that it's equitable and fair. So that being said, that's kind of the families of law. If we want to think quickly about procedural law. So just as the substantive law developed, right, this is the families of law developed, so too has our procedures. So today there are two primary families of procedural law. There is the inquisitorial system and the adversarial system. 
So the inquisitorial system is what we see a lot in civil law countries, right? So again, France, um, you get arrested for something, you get taken to court, the judge questions you and, and you have an attorney there, but the attorney doesn't really do anything. Um, and you're expected to answer questions and you're expected to be actively involved in your own case, even if it's testifying against yourself. Then we have the adversarial system. So the United States follows the adversarial system. The adversarial system developed from medieval, and again, it, not using this in terms of words stated in the Capitol riot, um, the adversarial system d d evolved via trial by combat, right? So it's actually kind of cool to think about. And there's a picture over on the right side of your screen, uh, which shows a trial by combat. You see everybody's kind of there trying to look and watch what's going on. Um, the idea behind trial by combat um, has been abandoned. Um, we don't put two people in a ring and then the one that kills the other one was ordained by God as the right person or the person who was telling the truth and the one that died is the one who was not telling the truth. Right? Like that was problematic, um, a little barbaric and very problematic. So that being said, if we look at the current system, it's still very highly symbolic of these trials by combat. Right? So in a trial by combat, you had the opportunity to elect a champion. The champion is somebody who would fight on your behalf, right? So they would go into the ring and fight on your behalf. Sounds a lot like a lawyer. You hire one to go fight on your behalf. They engage in a battle. Well, that sounds like a trial. The goal is to discern the ultimate truth. In jury trials, we try to get to verdicts. And verdict means the truth. So if you kind of like actually do a really kind of interesting comparison of what a trial by combat was, it you, met, you see it in the United States. Right? Like if you take a step back and look at our just system, and we're going to talk about all the different levels and how to work our system and all that jazz in, in later videos. But if you take a step back and look at our system, you see that it is literally um, trial by combat, but without the bloodshed, All right? So we still definitely have a trial by combat situation. Um, and in this situation, there is a judge, right? Uh, and the judge acts as a passive participant. The judge is only there to ensure that there's a fair battle. And that would be true in an adversarial system as well, you, that you would have two people who are, um, two champions who have the same skill or, 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 or um, at least equipped with knife or, or with swords or whatever they needed to be to make the battle fair, right? So we don't want it one-sided. Uh, we don't want somebody calling the mountain in. Um, we want to make it fair. So this is kind of where we evolved from is, is this picture on the right. Um, and it's not that much different today, except there's no swords or bloodshed. Something that, that you definitely need to know moving forward, um, especially if, if you're continuing in criminal justice or if you're continuing in legal studies, um, are elements of a crime, right? So during their battle, the prosecution has to prove what's called the corpus delicti, or the corpus delicti, excuse me. Um, it's the basically the elements of a crime, right? Beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. Now, this includes the actus reus, excuse me, the actus reus, which is the criminal or evil act, uh, the mens rea, which is the um, evil mindset, concurrence, so the mindset and the act had to occur at the same time, any attendant circumstances, so is there anything in the statute that you also have to prove? Um, if it's a harm-based offense like murder, you have to prove causation, and you also have to prove a harm. So think about it this way. All right, we have Latin term for corpus del CD refers to principle that there must be some proof that a crime has been committed before a person can be convicted of having committed the crime, right? So we have on the left side, the consequence or injury is a result of a person's intentional lawful act versus a certain consequence or injury 
has occurred, right? And that's really where we're talking about um, this, this idea of harm coming into play. So let's look at the, there's actually an equation. And this is the basic equation um, for uh, corpus deliciti uh, in a criminal harm-based offense. Right, so we have the actus reus where we have a voluntary act is always required. We have the mens rea where criminal intent, usually strict liability, unless a strict li and, and usually required unless it's a strict liability offense. And there's different levels of intent. There's purposefully, there's knowingly, there's recklessly, and there's negligently. And they are on a, they're on a moving scale, right? Purposely being the obviously most evil, the most horrible thing because it's your purpose to commit this crime. Knowingly, you're all but certain that the crime will happen. Recklessly, uh, you knew there was a risk that something would happen, but you didn't care and you did it anyway, but you didn't want it to happen. And then negligently is you didn't know there was a risk, you should have known, and you went ahead and did it anyway, all right? Uh, then we have concurrence, the act in, actus reus and the mens rea occurred together, attendant uh, circumstances, anything that's connected to the crime and usually makes it worse. Right, so it's like breaking and entering into a home at night to commit a felony therein is burglary. Um, if you break into somebody's home during the daytime, prosecutor can't charge you with burglary because they can't prove that it was night uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. So 10 circumstances do come into place. They have to be, everything on this, 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 this screen has to be proven to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt before somebody in the United States can be found guilty of a crime. Now, there's also, if we have a harm-based offense, we also look and to see if there's causation, right? So we have to make sure that the act, the actus reus, was the factual cause of the harm and the legal cause of the harm. So meaning, um, did it actually, did it in any way contribute to the, harm, that's factual. Was it the legal cause? Was it reasonably foreseeable that if you did this action, this harm would result? If it is, and we can prove everything by, beyond a reasonable doubt, and we can prove the harm exists, then we have a crime, right? And each criminal statute is going to have a different actus reus laid out, different mens rea, concurrence, intent circumstances, causation, etc. So this is kind of like an equation that we have to prove anytime we want to prove a crime occurred in the United States before a jury. Uh, so the actus reus again is required for every crime. We do have something called the voluntary act rule. So there must be at least one voluntary act committed by the defendant. So this excludes involuntary actions. So reflexes, convulsions, unconsciousness, um, hypnosis. I ask you to consider the uh, the case New York v. Levy, it's uh, box number 1.13 in your textbook. Um, and it deals with, um, in the state of New York, a um, person that was basically arrested for reckless driving. They were flying over the speed limit. They were crossing the line, all this stuff. Um, and they get arrested. And it, what it appears to be, what happens is, is um, the defense basically said he was having a seizure. The, the, the driver was having a seizure. He had, he had no control. Like he was just driving and just had a seizure. Um, so he shouldn't be held liable for, for reckless driving because he, he didn't do anything voluntarily. Like the fact that he was hitting the, the gas and like swerving all over was him seizing up. Um, so it wasn't done. It's not like he voluntarily put himself into an, a seizure. That would be a different story, but here there was no voluntary act, right? It actually reminds me of a, a, something I saw when I was a, a kid in Missouri. Um, we were in the city or the town, I should say, and um, it's it's a really sad story. There there, there was a um, minivan that had crashed, had gone down this like hill, and had crashed through the front of the Long John Silvers. I mean, you know what that is, it's, it's a fish restaurant. Uh, and it comes out later that the driver actually had a heart attack while driving, died while driving, and in doing so, hit the accelerator and the wheel turned and he drove through Long John Silvers. If he had survived, we'd be like, there's no voluntary act here, right? You didn't make yourself have a heart attack. 
Like you, you there, there'd be no voluntary act. So we have to have some voluntary act and it's only one and it can be very small, but as long as it's voluntary, then it qualifies. Now, mens rea is not required for every crime, unlike actus reus, which is required for every crime. So for instance, if we think about like statutory rape, statutory rape is a strict liability offense. So regardless if I, if, if let's say you are in a bar and you see another person and you're in like the hookup mood or whatever, and you decide to hook up with this person, but you say, you know, before we do, um, and you know, I wanna make sure that you're over the age of 18. Um, and you ask to see their driver's license and they give you their driver's license, they give you their passport, they give you all kinds of stuff. They give you a signed letter by the Pope, right? It says that he's over 18. So you go and you, or he or she, you, or whomever is over 18. So you go back to your place, you engage in copulation and the person surprises you in the morning saying, oh, by the way, I'm only 16. Guess what? Even though you had no purpose to violate the law, you tried everything that you could possibly do to ensure that you didn't violate the law. Statutory rape says if they're under the age of 18, and again, that depends on the state, um, but generally 18, you cannot engage in sex. They cannot consent to sex. So it's statutory rape. So everything that you did, even though they were in a bar and even though they showed you everything, doesn't matter. It's statutory rape. Right. So again, that's just something to be careful of, especially in your freshman year and sophomore year of college. Um, just always be sure. Right. Um, now, that being said, most crimes do require proof of a certain mental state. Now, this is the most difficult element to prove because it requires inferring um, a person's intent based upon their actions and the surrounding circumstances. Right, so we can't get inside somebody's head. We can't see if they're doing something knowingly, purpose, or purposely, knowingly, recklessly, or negligently. We can't see it. But we have to look at the situation and say, well, based upon the situation, it looks like this is what you were trying to do. Um, so that being said, as I said before, there are the four levels of mens rea. There's a scenario at box 1.14 that I suggest, um, highly suggest you take a look at. But levels of mens rea are purposely so that you intended to bring about a result. Knowingly, you're practically certain the result would occur, but it wasn't your purpose. Recklessly, you consciously disregarded a substantial and unjustifiable risk. Negligently, you should have been aware of a substantial and justifiable risk, but you weren't. And you can see these kind of go down in, in terms of um, severity. Right, purposely is the most severe. That's our first degree murders, right? Set knowingly, probably second degree, recklessly, negligently, that's where we're talking our manslaughters, right? So again, purposely is the most evil, negligently is the least evil, um, but it still talks about the, the mindset or the guilty mind. So again, we usually require concurrence. So the two things, two things have to uh, happen at the same time. Um, so if, let's say, you are in class and you're just like, oh my God, this guy is just talking forever. And um, you say, and you just, you daydream and you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to back over him. Like, I'm going to walk, like, I'm going to go into the parking lot and we'll wait for him to come out. And I'm just going to back over him with my car. Like that, that's what you daydream about. Um, and a couple of days goes by and you forget it. Like you move on to your next classes, a couple of days go by and I'm walking and I'm in your blind spot and you run over me with your car. Have you committed a crime? Well, did you have the mens rea at some point to run me over? Yeah. Did you run me over? Yeah. But did the intent to run me over occur at the same time that you ran me over? No. And that in and of itself means that that crime has not been committed. This is the idea of concurrence, right? That they have to have, the, the mental state and the voluntary act have to occur at the same time. Now, some statutes, as I said before, require attendant circumstances to be present. I uh, suggest you look at 1.15. If it's a harm offense, um, statutes will require causation. So factual and proximate causation um, as the harm in fact and proximate causation 
as we discussed before, is predicated on reasonable foreseeability. So if I pull this trigger of this gun that I know is loaded, is it reasonably, for, and, and I, pull, I put it in somebody's head, is it reasonably foreseeable that that person is gonna die? Like that their head's gonna explode and they're gonna die? Yeah, right? Um, you don't normally think, if I open this refrigerator door, is there a way that it's gonna bump into the cabinet and cause a knife to go flying off and a knife is gonna go through a window and that window and it's gonna kill somebody walking down the street? Um, was that a reasonable foreseeable consequence of you opening your refrigerator door? No, right? I mean, weird crap happens a lot. Um, and so this idea of reasonable foreseeability is a really big thing. Uh, was it reasonably foreseeable that what you did would lead to the harm? So that being said, I will um, wrap up our lecture here. I have uploaded um, for your own personal viewing, um, a uh, uh, series that we began in uh, last class, uh, looking at law school for everyone, right? Looking at law and, and criminal procedure. Um, I suggest that you look at this. Uh, this gets a little bit more into crime and the guilty mind, right? And um, what all it entails. And you'll see there's a lot there. And don't get overwhelmed. You're not, you're not expected to know this video for an exam purpose, right? Um, it's to kind of give you a preview of what law really is like and, and how, how do we work with the law and how intense and in depth the law really is. Because it seems very superficial and very shallow, right? Um, again, we read the dog bite statute. It seems to be very like, okay, yeah, I'm, I know what that means. But there's so much more to it. Right, and that's the big takeaway, is when we're talking about the judicial system, it's predicated on law. So last class we looked at who makes the law. This class we're looking at kind of what the criminal law looks like in general. So before we can, again, have a judicial system, we have to talk about law, All right? So we've talked about law. And in our next class, we're gonna look at the jurisdiction of American courts, right? So it's not just enough that you've broken a law, before you go into the judicial process, right, before the judicial process begins. But in order for the judicial process to actually begin, the court in question must have jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is broken up into several subtopics. Sub, there's several subtypes of jurisdiction, but generally they're all required and they have to be proven, usually by proponents of evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt, um, that a court hearing a case is the right court to hear it. Um, and that's what will kick off the adjudication process. That's what kicks off the judicial process. So we make the determination, does this court have jurisdiction? If they do, the judicial process begins. That being said, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email me, reach out to me, text me, call me, however you wanna get a hold of me. I'd be more than happy to discuss them with you. And I look forward to seeing you next class.